The first annual Reardon IVC and Cancer Symposium proudly presents IVC as Anti-Angiogenesis Therapy. Your presenters, Joe Kashari, Ph.D., and Nina Mikarova, Ph.D. Uh, just while we're getting set up, can everyone hear me? Okay, so I'm okay, on when the time good. comes. Okay. We're going to tag team this, so I'm going to give some of the background info on angiogenesis on vitamin C, and then Nina's going to tag in and present some of her data, some of which has already been published and some of which is in preparation. And am I still waiting for a cue? Or? Ready. I'm ready. All right, then. With Without further ado, I'm um, going to talk a bit about cancer, about angiogenesis, and about vitamin C. And let's just go right to it. I really don't want to, I didn't know how many of you had cancer backgrounds, and I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. There's really only one main point I want to make about this slide, and that is that there are several distinguishing characteristics that separate cancer cells from normal cells, genetic, metabolic, and so forth. And as why all of these are subject to research, I would say by and large for the, that for the last 50 years or so, the treatments have all focused on this property, the unregulated cell proliferation. And that's, here's a slide just to discuss why cancer cells are particularly difficult to deal with, why we have the underwhelming change in the death rates over the last 50 years. Tumors are heterogeneous heterogeneous, meaning that even within a microscopic subregion of a tumor, you have fractions of sen chemotherapy sensitive and chemotherapy resistant cells. Um, tumors are able for a variety of reasons to evade the immune system. We have angiogenesis, which is the growth of new blood vessels into and towards the tumor, and we'll be talking a lot about that. Tumors, of course, then are invasive, they're metastatic, and they cause cachexia and other problems. Now, the classical paradigm for drug treatment is to give essentially poisons that kill proliferating cells in the hopes that they'll knock out the tumor cells before they knock out the host. Two main problems with that over the years. One has been the side effects, which are sometimes severe, and the second has been the phenomenon of drug resistance, and this is just classic natural selection when you treat someone with something like adriamycin, you kill off the adriamycin-sensitive cells, but the resistant ones may stay in a dormant state such that when the tumor recurs, it's adriamycin refractory and you have to use something else. So with vitamin C, with nutritional therapies in general, we're really trying to look at a different approach, a different paradigm, and that is what we, I'd say working with the body and not against it. And one of the things about vitamin C, whether in a particular case it's effective against the tumor or not, is it definitely improves the patient's health and well-being. Um, also, we believe there's some effective tumor cell killing involved. And there are a host of uh, biological responses that are favorable, including interfering with new blood vessel growth. So let's talk a bit about angiogenesis. Excuse me. On my list of worst things that can happen to me during a talk, it's forgetting to turn off my watch alarm. I'm supposed to pick my son up from the school bus. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, my, hopefully they're not having school on Saturday. Um, this is just to show you that even in the microscopic region of a tumor, like a millimeter in diameter, you have what Dr. Neal was describing, proliferating rim, a quiescent zone, and a necrotic core. And typically, it's the cells in the proliferating rim that are sensitive to treatment. So this makes it difficult to treat the tumor. It also would limit the tumor's growth, such that most tumors can't really grow beyond this size in this configuration because they don't have enough glucose and oxygen, can't clear their lactic acid, and so forth. And this is where angiogenesis kicks in. And this is what Nina's going to really talk about. Tumor cells produce a variety of cytokines. One important one is vascular endothelial growth factor. And this substance actually encourages blood vessel growth towards the tumor. 
Endothelial cells are the blood vessel cells involved both in the mature endothelial cells and Dr. Mikarova has data with endothelial progenitor cells, which are relatively recently discovered and thought to be important in instigating the angiogenesis process. To discuss mechanism a little bit, various things that have to happen for the new blood vessels to form. One is that the endothelial cells have to be able to digest the extracellular matrix so they can make their way toward the tumor. We need to have a stimulation of endothelial cell proliferation. This process tends to be regulated by nitric oxide, and Dr. Mikarov, I believe, will discuss this some. And also, there are grappling hook molecules, integrins, and coherins that are important in making this angiogenesis process happen. Just to show you that we've seen it in real life, this is the uh, allantoic membrane of a chick, egg em chick embryo. Uh, normally very well vascularized in a sort of random sense. It doesn't show up here, but we just, this is not even tumor cells, this is just extracts from the growth medium that the tumor cells were in. So you can see the effects of the tumor produced cytokines stimulating the blood vessels to gr dramatically grow towards it. Once this happens, you tend to have a positive feedback effect because as you get more, new blood supply to the tumor, you get an increase in tumor cell population, leads to an increase in VEGF, which in turn stimulates more angiogenesis. Also, there'll be some feedback with the white blood cells that are coming in as they would to try to do wound healing. And this can inadvertently stimulate more angiogenesis and help, and help the tumor. I'll bet some of you have heard of Dr. Judah Folkman, who kind of discovered angiogenesis in relation to tumors. And he also was interested in angiostatin and endostatin, which are in clinical trials right now. What the gist of this is, is that tumors produce these molecules that actually inhibit angiogenesis. And that may seem to contradict what I just said, but the important point is the angiogenesis promoters accumulate locally at the site of the tumor, whereas the inhibitors are distributed throughout the body. So at the site of the primary tumor, it's pro-angiogenic, whereas at the site of the uh, metastases, say, it's anti-angiogenic. So that metastatic region can remain dormant until the primary is removed by surgery. And then once that happens, the angiostatin and endostatin levels go down, and the metastases can induce angiogenesis. And when Nina presents her data, you'll see that she's looked at a bunch of different models for angiogenesis. And part of this is examining these different potential targets by which we can try to interfere with the tumor angiogenesis process. One is anything that blocks the cytokine vascular endothelial growth factor. Another would be anything that would inhibit endothelial cell proliferation. We can also sabotage the nitric oxide regulation system, try to prevent the um, ability to burrow through the extracellular matrix and try to interfere with their ability to uh, form vessels. This is just a list compiled earlier this year of things that are currently approved or in clinical trials. Avastin is an antibody to VEGF and I was kind of underwhelmed to read that it increased survival by five months. I guess that's nothing to sneeze at if you live those extra five months, but it also has a lot of severe side effects. There are some in clinical trials. Uh, two I want to point out, because uh, besides the angiostatin and endostatin, which we've discussed, um, our old friend thalidomide. Thought you might be curious about that and a drug that is a component of shark cartilage. Remember when shark cartilage was alternative therapy. So <laughs> it's actually sort of close to making it to the big time. We'll have to stay tuned. Um, and before we let Nina dive into her angiogenesis data, I want to step back and talk a little about vitamin C, which I know you've already heard of. Some of this is going to repeat, but hopefully I can help out and weigh in a bit on the whole dose thing also. Um, Vitamin C can have both antioxidant and pro-oxidant properties, primarily an antioxidant under normal physiological conditions. 
It also has a variety of biological functions. It supports the immune system. Dr. Neal mentioned the neutrophils earlier, collagen, extracellular matrix, and it plays a role in carnitine synthesis, all important things for maintaining body and health. Here is what I think are two, probably two of the major stumbling blocks if you are a classical drug development person and you're wondering what the deal is with vitamin C. One is that there's some clinical experience that preceded some of the lab work, which is unusual because vitamin C is a nutrient. We all know, for instance, that vitamin C levels are low in cancer patients. And also when you give a certain infusion of vitamin C, it does not spike the plasma in the cancer patients the way it does in the healthy adults. They seem to have a sink for vitamin C. Um, we all, we've had shown that intravenous levels are safe, and I was around here back in the day when if you gave so Neil can tell you these stories, if you gave 10, wanted to give someone 10 grams of vitamin C, you might have a nurse running up and down the hallway saying they're gonna die. Um, and I'll discuss briefly a phase one study. The possible mechanisms, this is kind of the other stumbling block when you do classic drug development of a pharmaceutical, you have a good one sentence answer to what the mechanism of action is. Whereas for us, it's, you ask me that question, I'll say like, do you have a half hour? Um, it can support the immune system. It protects the extracellular matrix. Dr. Neal discussed this. We have the hydrogen peroxide generating uh, direct toxicity mechanism. And the data Nina is going to show you the angiogenesis mechanism. These are all potentially valid mechanisms that have been verified in the laboratory. And to the extent that concentration and dose are relevant, we've confirmed that the concentrations where these effects are important can be matched physiologically, at least with intravenous administration. Um, Kind of the gist of all of my, this is, these are the hollow fiber models. I was glad to hear them get some props today. Um, you grow tumor cells in a small fiber. And remember that heterogeneity, those non-proliferating resistant cells that are in here. So that gives kind of a sterner test of cytotoxicity than a monolayer would. And some of the things I learned was yes, you can kill vitamins, you can kill these cells with ascorbate. It's, and the LC50 is reduced by a factor of five, I think it is, with lipoic acid. And because someone asked me this earlier, with these lipoic acid studies, I use two forms of it. I use the classic lipophilic form at a one to 100 ratio of lipoic acid to vitamin C. And I used a water-soluble salt, sodium lipoate, at a one to 10 ratio. Most of you are gonna, administer lipoic acid if you do so in the lipophilic form with the 1 to 100 ratio. Um, and I do want to mention that we, I also looked at this in the guinea pig model. Um, I'm not the reason we were picketed. I did that after. Um, this is just a primary tumor subcutaneously, which metastasizes underneath the arm and the leg of the guinea pig. We would give the tumor 10 days to get established and then uh, administer the ascorbate. Couple of points I want to make with this, not that all these numbers are important per se, but notice when the guinea pig has the tumor, the, its adrenal vitamin C levels, which I was kind of using as a gauge of tissue stores of vitamin C, those are way down. And you correct that with treatment. Secondly, we're able to get the tumor concentrations up into the one to two millimolar range. And I want you to keep that millimolar order of magnitude in mind. In this study, we did show that both the primary and the metastatic portions of the tumor were, their growth rates were reduced compared to untreated controls. Some of this isn't in your syllabus because I snuck those two slides in in the middle of the night, you know, later. But this one is there, and this is, this is kind of my favorite one. What it's showing you is that there's a good inverse correlation between intratumor ascorbate concentration and tumor growth. And what we're finding is when you get to around between one and two millimolar, if you can get, and I think if you can get within two, a millimolar or two at the site of the tumor, then you're in a 
concentration region where several of the mechanisms we've been discussing are, are relevant. And what I try to do in response to that is setting this as a goal. Now this is, if you do a pharmacokinetic two compartment model, you predict a peak level and you predict a sort of average area under the curve type level. If you set a target of getting that in the couple of millimolar range, look for peaks in the 10 to 15 millimolar range if you're measuring a patient's plasma post in infusion. And for our typical data for your stereotypical 70 kilogram healthy adult, that should be a range of 30 grams or so should get you there. So it's my belief just to weigh in on this concentration and dose stuff that 30 grams for an average person should get you to the region where things we've been discussing and things Dr. Nina will discuss concerning anti-angiogenesis, toxicity and so forth can take place. And you will really want, Dr. Jackson made the excellent point of you'll really want to measure for your particular patient to see what their plasma level is because that could give you a guide into how much they need. Now as far as safety goes, we looked at 24 patients going from zero to 60 grams. We did not find a toxic limiting dose, so I really can't say, speak to anything about whether there's an upper limit for how much IVC you can give people. Um, the renal function parameters were okay. We looked at things like BUN, uric acid, and so forth, things that you would expect to go crazy if renal function was compromised and they didn't. White blood cell counts remain stable. We actually had one person do well and lasted an extra 48 weeks, went through the treatment. Uh, so that was one case of stable disease. Um, there was one person who had renal calculus. This was a person who had a history of it. So we placed that as amongst the warnings. And there was some edema for some people, just the effect of getting continuous infusions of all this fluid. And so here's the cheat sheet to the Reardon protocol. Start with 15, go to 30, go higher or lower, depending on what your patient's levels actually are. And now I'm going to tag out and let Dr. Mikarova present the good stuff with the angiogenesis data. Okay. Uh, we consider that it's important to um, understand mechanism how vitamin C can affect tumor cells because it will give us knowledge about um, and scientific basis to treat uh, cancer patients with intravenous vitamin C. The mechanism which uh, uh, high doses of ascorbic acid can uh, kill tumor cells uh, were discussed, I will not repeat it, but I wanted only to emphasize that we have difficulties with direct mechan mechanism of killing tumor cells by hydrogen peroxide, because um, if it's a low concentration in tumor, it can stimulate uh, growth of tumor cells. Also, uh, for creation of uh, ascorbic acid uh, radicals, we need uh, some metal, and there is no metalloprotein catalyst in extracellular fluid. And recent data uh, were published which showed that there is no uh, uh, any uh, ascorbic uh, 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 radicals in blood, and it's very low level in extracellular fluid. So, uh, based on this data, and as we had um, therapeutic efficiency of um, intravenous vitamin C uh, injections, we decided to hypothesize uh, another mechanism. It was based on uh, angiogenesis. So um, before I will go to angiogenesis, I wanted to uh, uh, explain you uh, what also gave me this um, feeling that we need to go to uh, from um, oxidative stress to maybe another mechanism. Uh, um, when Dr. Uh, Reardon was uh, alive, uh, he was interested to measure oxidative stress in plasma before and after intravenous 
intravenous vitamin C because it was a lot of papers that raised concerns that high doses of vitamin C can promote free radical generation in blood and uh, in cells. So we did this experiments and we measured level of antioxidant protection of plasma before and after intravenous vitamin C. Here uh, I presented some data. So um, it was uh, really uh, complicated assay in which we measured total uh, antioxidant capacity of plasma. And uh, assay is based on uh, some reagent that generates free radical with constant rate. And there is some uh, also fluorescent protein. So oxidation of this fluorescent protein can be uh, like, like measure of uh, anti antioxidant protection. So what we did, uh, we added in vitro experiments, we added a different concentrations of ascorbic acid in plasma, and then we measured time of protection. And we can see that time of protection of plasma was increased with increasing uh, concentration of ascorbic acid. And in next uh, experiments, we did the same for uh, patients with cancer and for healthy subjects, we measured level of uh, antioxidant capacity of plasma before and after intravenous vitamin C. You can see increased level of antioxidant protection uh, from for 15 grams, 25 grams, and we did not uh, notice improvement for 50 grams. It, uh, maybe a result of saturation of plasma by ascorbic acid, or maybe it was limitation of our assay. Also, I presented here, you can see protection for cancer patient, low uh, curve, and then improvement after intravenous vitamin C. And improvement was three times here, uh, about uh, 20 minutes, and uh, uh, I think it's a, a six, yeah, yeah, 60. And um, for uh, cancer patients, we also notice low level of protection uh, than for healthy subject, and it was improved with intravenous vitamin C. Also, I want to uh, sh shortly um, mention about this graph. I measured level of ATP in blood cells before and after intravenous vitamin C. We did not notice oxidative stress or damage of cells. And uh, this is sometimes in some um, paper you can read that uh, it uh, caused a decrease of level of energy metabolism. And I think it's because, for example, we separated cells from blood and we plate it in medium and it, it was oxidative stress because uh, in medium there is not such protective uh, antioxidant and uh, protective properties so this is what we showed for uh, pl uh, plasma and based on difficulties of mechanism of um, killing tumor cells by uh, uh, um, oxidative stress or um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, we decided that we will analyze another uh, mechanism. And this data we published in uh, Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine. We analyzed uh, several types of cells. First of all, um, we developed here at the center method of uh, separation endothelial progenitor cells. And I will not go into details. It's, it's too long. Uh, um, it's an interesting procedure. And then we used um, available two mature endothelial cell lines. We used se uh, several assays, which I will explain later. It was migration. We measured change in energy metabolism, level of ATP, tubal formation uh, uh, in vitro it's uh, assay and also in vivo assay, like a water ring assay and metrogel plug. And also we tried to find mechanism, and we decided to analyze the uh, effect of high doses of ascorbic acid on nitric oxide production. So as a result of, uh, I will mention uh, now, but and I will show more in more detail each assay, we found that concentration of ascorbic acid higher than 100 milligram per deciliter suppressed capillary tube formation, migration of endothelial cells, and we um, also uh, found suppression of nitric oxide availability. So here I presented um, in 
which uh, model which allowed uh, to measure effect of different treatment on uh, vessel formation. Cells were plated on much gel and uh, we have control when, where you see development of endothelial cells when you plate in some um, uh, special medium on covered um, uh, wells, it, it develop, they start to develop this vessel structure. So we can see this vessel structure for control uh, cells and cells which were treated by as, um, ascorbic acid. And you can see that so it was not so many closed loops and not such developed structure. Um, here I presented um, average data for all analyzed cell lines. Uh, you can see that we had inhibition of tubule formation uh, for doses which were higher than 100 uh, milligram per uh, deciliter or one milligram per milliliter. And this dosage can be achieved uh, by 15 grams of intravenous vitamin C. Effect was more profound for, um, and for progenitor cells. We also found that um, if uh, vessels were established, we did not find that it was such effect. So it was only for new developed vessels, which was also probably a um, good result. Uh, to explain why uh, uh, we did not have this developed structure, we analyzed level of migration of endothelial cells for different experimental conditions with ascorbic acid. And it's uh, really very easy assay, cell migration assay by wound healing. We simply made scratch by sterile plastic and then measured level of gap filling with, with time for different um, ascorbate concentrations. And you can see that um, after eight hours, for example, uh, uh, endothelial cell filled uh, gap and for uh, cells which were treated by, uh, no, for example, high dosage of um, 30 uh, milligram per deciliter, it was only 30% of filling of gap. So uh, this uh, also uh, uh, we uh, decided to study what is the cause of um, uh, decreased level of migration, for example, of endothelial cells or tubule formation. And we think that uh, nitric oxide may be one of the mechanisms. Because nitric oxide is important for modulation and expression of endogenesis. It's uh, involved in tumor formation. And tumors that generate high level of nitric oxide have more developed a structure, vascular structure, and are more invasive. And endogenesis is dependent on nitric oxide. So um, we added to our cells nitric oxide inhibitor, which is derivative of arginine. And we analyzed how inhibitor of nitric oxide uh, synthase can affect tubule formation. So you can see here control and uh, treated cells with nitric oxide inhibition. And we can see those dependent inhibition of tubule formation. And then we uh, ask some study question, can also high doses of ascorbic acid decrease level of nitric oxide production in cells? For nitric oxide production, we use special probe, which become fluorescent under exposure to nitric oxide. So cells were treated with um, different concentrations of ascorbic acid and uh, um, not long time, uh, about one, one and a half hour, because these concentrations can be uh, achieved uh, after um, 15, 25 milligram per deciliter, uh, uh, 15 grams and um, 25, 30 grams of uh, intravenous vitamin C. So, and uh, this concentration not stay very long in, in body, more than two, three hours. So we can see that it was decreased of level of production of nitric oxide with increased concentration of ascorbic acid. Let me go to uh, another uh, mechanism. So we think that there are also maybe another mechanism of suppression growth, uh, 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 vascular growth in a tumor. Uh, after high uh, doses of uh, ascorbic acid. And angiogenesis-related uh, genes may be 
involved in this process. I presented here uh, some data from research group which uh, were published recently, and they showed in animal experiment that uh, um, after treatment of uh, mice with uh, high dosage of uh, ascorbic acid, there is a suppression of genes which are responsible for angiogenesis. It's um, vascular endothelial growth factor uh, is produced by these genes, uh, uh, fibroblast growth factor, and matrix metalloproteinase. So first three bars, it's control. High level of expression of these genes is in um, group of animals not treated by ascorbic acid, by uh, had developed tumor. And uh, this three next bar, it was treatment of these um, animals by high uh, doses of ascorbic acid. Uh, in addition to our in vitro model, we decided to analyze in vivo um, uh, effect of ascorbic acid on angiogenesis. We have time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is very interesting model. Uh, development of uh, microvessels from, um, let me show you. Development of uh, vessels from our ring is uh, due to uh, expansion of uh, endothelial cells from existing blood vessels, uh, also due to progenitor cells and uh, stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells. So here I presented um, um, from the beginning, on day first, development and sprouting of vessels from this uh, aorta rings. And then here it's on fourth day. And um, on your left, you can see that it's um, control, not treated uh, development of vessels. And here it's treated vessels with uh, 100 milligram per deciliter of ascorbic acid, which can be achieved by 15 grams of. Uh, in, uh, vitamin C injection. So um, we, here is uh, average data for all experiments with this um, assay. So you can see that for control, it was development of vessels. For treated, we uh, found that it was, in, from the beginning, inhibition of the rate of growth. For example, if it, in control, it was 50% increase each they for treated it was only 20 percent. So in, uh, inhibition of rate of growth and for high concentration we even had some uh, inhibition of number of these vessels in uh, uh, wells. So it was dose related and it showed that um, uh, high doses of ascorbic acid can inhibit sprouting of vessels in this model. Uh, in the next experiments, we analyze the same uh, effect uh, uh, ascorbic acid on angiogenesis in animal model. So we injected uh, matrix gel in uh, ventral zone of mice, and this matrix gel uh, had uh, growth factors, so it secretes growth factors, and um, after um, two weeks of, um, uh, we, when we removed this is after two weeks I, I, I presented image. When we removed this matrix gel, we found that it's a lot of blood vessels, uh, blood vessels, sorry, were formed in matrix gel. Uh, mice were treated uh, each other day by dose, dosage which is equal to 30 grams per 70 kilogram person. So after two weeks, we removed this uh, plug and we analyzed uh, cells which uh, and vessels which were formed were analyzed by immunohistochemical analysis uh, uh, phen phenotype of these cells by staining CD34, CD31 antibodies, and also we counted number of uh, uh, vessels which were formed in this matrix gel. And let me show here. Here is images, morphology um, images of this. Um, uh, slice of these cells. You can see that it was development of big vessels, and we, we think that it's from surrounding tissue probably. And also it was some uh, small uh, vessels, capillary, which were filled with erythrocytes. So we counted this uh, number of these vessels, and 
there's also the capillary structure and density of capillary structure it's also parameter which can uh, describe level of angiogenesis so um, by measuring these two parameters we compared number of these uh, vessels in co uh, control in treated animal and we sh uh, showed difference in microvessel formation in control in treated mice and we also um, uh, think that uh, this uh, structure was also formed by uh, progenitor cells which m migrate and then differentiate in endothelial mature endothelial cells and uh, in conclusion uh, I'd like to say the discovery of positive and negative regulators of angiogenesis allow the development of new strategies to inhibit pathological uh, angiogenesis uh, especially in cancer and many developed drugs have anti-agenogenic activity but they are toxic and side effect and toxicity of drug are important because um, many of them require prolonged administration so we, we think that integrative approach for managing a patient with cancer should target multiple pathways and uh, we, we need to minimize normal tissue toxicity and we hope that our research gives additional information that demonstrate the potential of ascorbic acid as high doses um, I mean high doses of ascorbic acid in cancer treatment thank you the first annual Reardon IVC and cancer symposium was brought to you by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International, located at 3100 North Hillside, Wichita, Kansas, USA. To learn more about the center and what we have to offer, please visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.